Again, I'm struck by the Americanness of the throngs of people. Every race, dozens of ethnicities, different ways of dressing, and certainly widely varying opinions about politics and life and Islam. But I guess that's the old America. Now we all have one thing in common, a religion that makes us enemies of the state. The state all of us are citizens of, the one most of us were born into. As we approach the hub, I'm gutted by another realization. The armed guards, the ones looking down on us, they're all American too. I scan the midway for the face of the guard with the compass tattoo, the one who seemed... I stopped that thought. It doesn't matter what I see in his face or in his eyes. To him, I'm the enemy, and to me, he is my jailer. We walk into the vast hub of the auditorium. Unity, security, prosperity. The words fill a giant screen at the back of the stage. Even with the hundreds of people filing in, the space feels cavernous. I shudder when I think of the many internees who might be forced to join us here or be taken to other camps as yet unnamed and unpopulated. Muslims make up only about 1% of the total U.S. population, but that's still almost 3.5 million people. How can they imprison all of us? That would be like arresting 90% of Los Angeles. Beside the logistics, the very thought of it would be should be impossible to imagine here in America. A large man wearing a black suit walks to the center of the stage. It's the same blotchy-faced man who watched the guards take down that kid. The loud echo of his footfalls quiets the buzz of voices in the hall. His face still looks like his tie cuts off the circulation to his head. He's flanked by what seems like seems to be his own security detail. They don't wear military uniforms, but suits, like the Secret Service. And with their flashy haircuts and vicious grins, they'd fit right in at a Unite the Right rally. The man stares at us as we enter, his eyes like daggers, and his blueberry-purple lips drawn into a plastic smile. If he were to add a polo shirt with a whistle around his neck, he'd look suspiciously like Mr. Connors, the thick-necked football coach in my high school. His voice thunders through the crowd. Welcome to Mobius. I'm the director of our camp, which takes its name from the Mobius Arch Loop Trail nearby. Welcome? I whisper in my mom's ear. He makes it seem like we had a choice to come here. My mom squeezes my hand and gives me her be quiet look, lips in shushing gesture, eyebrows drawn together. Now, we want to make life here as peaceful and as enjoyable as possible. Take a little time to familiarize yourself with the camp and its layout. It's a big place, and there are a lot of opportunities here. There are recreation areas for the children as well as for the adults. We're planning a vegetable garden. There's a warehouse where you can collect your rations and, of course, the mess, where we'll take our dinners together as a community. I stare at the director, almost in awe of how he is able to twist the idea of imprisonment to make it seem like sleepaway camp. Community, opportunity, recreation, garden. He speaks like it's the he's the entertain, entertainment director on a cruise ship, not the warden of a prison camp. Looking around, I see people staring ahead, wide eyes brimming with fear, with tears seething with anger. Some of them hush their babies, gently bouncing them so they don't cry out, trying to give them some comfort. Watching this simple act of love destroys me. A prison camp isn't a place for children. It isn't a place for anyone. I lock eyes with the toddler, a little girl who can't be more than two or three. Her green eyes are bright, but dark circles under them betray her lack of sleep. Like the rest of us, she's tired. She stares at me in that heart-shaped face. I see something familiar, something I've seen before. I rack my brain. Refugees. Syrian refugees, that's who she reminds me of. A photo of a little girl, probably her age, staring through a chain-link fence into a photographer's lens. But that girl, the photographer caught her in the moment when the light in her eyes was extinguished. Stamped out, not merely by fear, but by being forgotten, by the complacency of the world around her. I first saw that picture in the daily digital news feed our history teacher made us subscribe to, and I think it might be the loneliest picture I've ever seen. This little girl, the one with the heart-shaped face, God, I don't want that light taken from her. But I also see a few people nodding mechanically, probably thinking we should go along, maybe believing it will get them out of here sooner. I can't figure out if they're utterly, utterly clueless or genuinely hopeful that justice will prevail. You'll notice we've divided the blocks by your ethnic and cultural backgrounds. 
The authority believes you'll be more comfortable among your own people. My people are Americans, all of them. The director continued in his upbeat vocal swagger. To help ease your transition, each block has its own minders, and the minders speak your language for the most part so they can understand everything. The director pauses, then repeats himself. Everything. What an a-hole. Each of his words bulge with threats. We're watching you. We're listening. We're everywhere. He continues, they're available night or day to assist you. He points to a row of a couple of dozen people seated behind him. There are, they are us. Some in hijab, some in topis, some in jeans and t-shirts. Every race and ethnicity represented the camp. Who needs your government to bring you down when your own people will do it for them? The director motions for the minders to rise. These fine people share your background, understand your concerns. They come from your community, and they have kindly volunteered their time to help ease your transition into life at Mobius. Traitors! Fascists! A woman with her light brown hair pulled back into a tight pon ponytail stands up in the middle of the auditorium and shouts at the minders on stage. A wave of murmurs pulses through the crowd, and some people at the back join her spontaneous protest. Traitors! The director's face reddens, but he keeps his voice calm. He motions to the guards to remove the woman who began the chants. We won't have disruptions at Mobius. We are the first camp, and we will set the standard. And there will be consequences for anyone straying from the regulations. As he speaks, two exclusion guards yank the woman from her seat and drag her to the aisle. The first guard pulls out handcuffs. The woman spits in the face of the second guard, who responds with a slap so hard that she falls to the floor. I feel sick to my stomach watching. The second guard moves to pull her up, but she flails at him and kicks him in the shin with the heel of her shoe. Then he tases her. A buzz fills the air along with a piercing scream. He tases her again. The guards grab her arms, hoist her up, and drag her limp body out of the auditorium. All eyes in the room watch the doors that slam shut. A silence descends. People are either too scared or too stunned to speak. No one seems sure where to look, at the floor, at one another. Some people cover their faces and mouths with their hands. I shake my head at my parents' stinging, tears stinging my eyes. I have no words. What are my words in the face of this? My mom pulls me closer and grasps my hand tighter. Eventually, our heads return to the stage and the director, who has been standing there unfazed, watching the scene unfold, not saying a word. It's terrifying kind of quiet. The kind in a horror movie that tells you something unspeakable is about to happen, and you're helpless to stop it. The director clears his throat. <clears throat> Remember our motto, he points to the screen behind him. Unity, security, prosperity. Now, dinner. Minders, call out your block number and walk them to the mess. When the minders call their blocks and march the short distance from the hub to the mess, hundreds of us follow in stunned silence. I think we're all shaken, not only at the cruelty of what we witnessed, but at the everydayness of it. How the director didn't flinch, how the guards delivered those volts with such ease. I wonder where the woman was taken, if that display was merely the tip of the iceberg. A drone hums overhead, recording our silent procession. The mess is a giant, characterless cafeteria like you'd find in a public high school or a prison. Long tables with blue plastic chairs lining the sides. My converse squeak against the gray and white checkerboard vinyl floor as I follow the masses inside. I guess it's vinyl? Some kind of epoxy coating, maybe? It actually feels a little squishy, soft underfoot. It's a large hall with a kitchen and a food line at one end and stone-colored and stone -colored walls with colorful posters about hand-washing and hygiene. Like I said, school or prison. There's a whiff of the bleach that is in our mercury home, but mixed with fried oil and what I used to call eau de cafeteria when I still ate lunch at school. The mess is also divided by blocks. Small cardboard table tents are labeled with block numbers so we know where to go. The din rises as people find their tables and their voices, though I can't imagine anyone is actually saying what is on their mind. My parents and I sort of hang out by our block tables, not sure what to do next. Then our minders pass by, introducing themselves. I'm Salim, and this is my wife, Fauzia. Glad to meet you. They're young. I bet they're only in their 20s, and they don't seem to have any kids. I saw them on our block earlier. 
They're Desi Americans, like us. But you know, more backstabbing and collaborating. I wonder how they came to this, what the impetus would be to turn against your own. I look around as people take seats in our segregated sections. South Asian, African American, Arab, Southeast Asian, East Asian, and Latinx too, though they seem to be fewer in number. So he was right. Everything is deliberate. Divide and conquer. We may all be Muslims, but we still have our own prejudices and racism. It's simpler to play out our internalized isms if you separate us and feed our fears. Easier to make us other ourselves and do the director's work for him. Today we're all Muslims, who, Muslims who've been forced here, but maybe it wouldn't be that hard to tap into our bigotry to turn us against one another, to turn our gaze from where our anger should be directed. Classic colonial conquest strategy. Just ask the British. Aisha approaches us. She's holding hands with a younger boy and walking next to a middle-aged man and woman. I assume they're her family. Auntie? Uncle, Aisha addresses my parents with the automatic honorific accorded all desis of parental age. Some of us may have lost our mother tongue, as my nani used to call it, but the custom of Tamiz, respect, for elders stays strong despite decades of assimilation. These are my parents, Afiya and Zaki, and my little brother, Zubair, Aisha says. Our parents shake hands. Assalamu alaikum, nice to meet you, my dad says. He pauses, then speaks again. Ah, oh, so much dust in this place. Yes, we can't even open the windows in our, um, Mercury home, my mom says. Aisha's mom jumps in. I don't know how we'll keep our clothes clean at all. I look at Aisha and she shakes her head a little. I guess dust is going to be like the weather, the thing you talk about when you can't think of anything else to say. We're allowed to get our food only when our block number is called. When it's our turn, Aisha and I head towards the line and our parents follow. We file past the cafeteria workers to collect our plates of rice and some unrecognizable vegetable stew. There are milk boxes, fruit cups, and jello. I feel nauseous, she says, looking at the food. I don't know if I can eat. Same, I say. It's like junior high all over again, Aisha grimaces as we walk back to our table. Down to the hairnets and surly looks from the cafeteria workers. I scowl as I take my first bite. Ugh, and apparently the only seasoning is salt. Is this supposed to be some kind of desi dish? Serving this in a Pakistani home would be sufficient reason to be disowned. Aisha scoots closer to me and whispers, The director, holy crap. My upper body stiffens. I look around, worried that someone will hear her, but the clatter of lunch trays and cutlery is loud enough, so I let go of the tension of my shoulders. I know, it's terrifying. It's like he's not even a real person. But the thing is, he is a person, which I guess makes it even more frightening. The scariest monsters are the one who seem the most like you. Where do you think they'll take that woman? Aisha asks, lowering her voice to the barest whisper, even though I don't think anyone else can hear her. Part of me doesn't want to think about it. Jail, maybe? I mean, besides this open-air prison we're all in? I guess there's probably some kind of holding area here, I don't know. I kind of don't want to know what's happening to her, I admit. I hope they don't hurt her, I mean, more than they already have. I know I'm being naive, but I want to hold on to some hope for the woman, for all of us, even if it's a false one. It's not like we have civil liberties in here, or lawyers, Aisha puts her hand over her mouth as this dawns on her. It's like Guantanamo, except in California. I'm scared of what will happen if we get stuck here. There has to be something we can do. My voice trails off. Aisha's eyes grow wide. She opens her mouth and snaps it shut without a word. Maybe I've said too much. We're quiet for a while. I don't think either of us can stomach any more discussion about the consequences the woman from the auditorium might be facing. I push aside my plate of internment slop and tear open the fruit cup. So, which is your favorite? Aisha breaks the silence. Favorite what? Star Wars film. Remember our conversation from earlier at the train station? About Lando being the best? Ha, <laughs> crap. That really was just earlier today, wasn't it? Aisha nods and looks down, then shovels a bit of rice onto her fork and raises it to her mouth. She puts it back down and sighs. My stomach twists a little. I know what Aisha wants. A second of normalcy. I can give her that. I take a deep breath. Well, 
I haven't seen anything before The Force Awakens, and I only went to that because my parents made me. You haven't seen the prequels or the original trilogy? The Padres? Young Luke? This is a travesty. We have to fix that. I grin. My, my, my mom had this childhood crush on Luke Skywalker, I say. And it's true. She talks about waiting in line to see Star Wars when she's a kid, and I swear to God there's reverence in her voice, like it was a religious experience. She joined Twitter to follow Mark Hamill. Aisha laughs. I totally like your mom. But hello, Riz Ahmed in Rogue One, a Desi in Star Wars. I still haven't recovered. I laugh a little. It's nice to chuckle, to feel a moment of lightness. But I immediately silence myself because it also feels wrong. The moment of almost normalcy hurt. Salim, our minder, stands. He's got a neatly trimmed brown beard, which I think, which I think he hopes makes him look older, but it doesn't hide his baby face. Fazia stands next to him and smiles at us. They're almost the same height and build, maybe five foot six, both kind of skinny with shoulders like swimmers. Her smile feels almost genuine. Not Salim's, though. Apparently, he's not a good enough actor to make his slight smile look anything but forced. Block two. We will walk back to our mercy, our Mercury homes together. Remember, we operate as a team. Salim tries to make eye contact with as many people as possible while he speaks. He's so rigid and rehearsed. He sounds like a talking manual. There are lots of things to learn about, and I'm sure everyone would like to settle in, Fauzia adds. A 10 p.m. curfew is strictly enforced. We want our block to be perfect. The director has promised extra privileges for the blocks that meet standards without any violations. Remember, if you have questions, our door is always open. She pauses and then adds with a hesitant smile. There are cameras and drones will be monitoring. You'll be safe, unity, security, prosperity. Fauzia leaves us with the Urdu greeting go with God. But I notice that Salim grabs her hand and squeezes. She bites her lip and clears her throat. I mean, have a good night. Everyone in block two begins to stand. A few hours, a creepy camp motto, one violent display of authority, and we do what we're told. I do not like being told, especially when what I'm being told is so clearly wrong. Aisha and I say goodnight. Her parents are in a hurry to get back to the block, so they speed walk ahead. I don't blame them. The trailers might have cameras in them, but outside, in the open, it feels much more like we're animals in a pen, waiting to be slaughtered. It's completely dark. The searchlights from the watchtowers sweep the grounds with swaths of light while guards patrol on foot, guns and tasers at the ready. Their blank faces hide any feelings or fleeting doubts. As we turn the corner to block two, I stumble. The dirty blonde-haired guard with the tattoo is posted between blocks one and two. And like all the others, he has a taser and a gun. He turns and sees me looking at him. He tilts his chin and catches my eye, then spins his head back into its rigid, proper place. And that's the end of chapter seven. <laughs>